Sonic Echo. Also successfully navigating through an asteroid field of four million three hundred thousand. Never tell me the odds. Be prepared to jump to hyperspeed. Don't you mean hyperspace? Nope. Do you mean warp speed? We lost those engines five minutes ago. Sir, why didn't you just let them have it? Cuz SOS 80, we found it. We get to keep it. That's the rules of intergalactic salvage. But I believe an exception can be made when it is the long lost talisman of truth, sir. The most holiest of relics of the Kothakti Empire. It is still a pirates. Why don't you sit back and relax? Relax? Yes, relax. Try some X-1. The E-tapes are around here somewhere. So? The asteroids? Relax. It barely chipped the paint. I think I'm going to be faint. Here, have a listen to X-1, the classic series holding the record for the longest running sci-fi anthology ever produced for the air, spanning from 1955 to 1958 and including 130 episodes. As impressive as it was, science fiction audio was on the wane and television took over. But still, X-1 remains a pinnacle of science fiction at the time. Check out tonight's double feature with Hallucinatory Orbit and... Sir, eyes in the asteroid field. Uh, backseat droid. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, Hallucination Orbit by J.T. McIntosh. Mr. Chaka. Sir? Stand by to release pickup rocket. Yes, sir. We'll break orbit in eight hours. Have damage control pull the rods on the number three pile. Check leakage. Yes, sir. Try and have the locks cleared of all unessential personnel when that pickup rocket comes back. There's no point in making trouble. I understand, sir. Pickup rocket away, sir. Very well. Take over, Mr. Chaka. I will be in my quarters if I'm wanted. Well, now then, Mr. Danbury, make yourself comfortable. I thank you, Captain. You care for a drink? Scotch in that bowl, bourbon in the other. No, thank you. I can't get quite used to squirting liquor from a rubber bulb as if I were oiling a bearing. <laughs> well, you'd have a devil of a time pouring from a bottle in free fall. Well, how are you enjoying your trip? It's very interesting. It's very nice of you to give me a lift. You know, it would have been eight months before another ship came along. Oh, a lot more than that with the main Pluto beam station out. Probably eight years. Really? That long? I thought the whole run to Pluto was under 18 months. Yes, it is when the beam is running. You see, Mr. Danbury, we left Earth 27 days after the beam broadcast from Pluto station broke. We've been spaceborne close to six years. I suppose that's why you're on orbit around this planet, picking up supplies or something, eh? Oh, oh. This is a standard pickup for the space beam service. We sent a rocket down to take off a man who's been the only inhabitant of this planet for... A little over two years. Well, I expect he'll be glad to see you. 
Well, there's no telling. <laughs> I know I would. After two years of duty, Mr. Danbury, you might not know anything. Oh, psychiatric troubles? Solitosis. It's from the Latin, solus, alone. Is that uh, much of a problem? Only in space. Here, look. <coughs> ah, look through that port. Seems empty. It is. It's empty of horizon, sky, sunlight, ground. It's empty of time. It's empty of people. You can't live in it too long without something happening. I see. But surely people have been alone before space flight. Oh, yes, but they have been on the same world with other people. And that seems to make a difference. You take a hermit on Earth, he may spend his life trying to escape civilization. But put him on a deserted world, he turns psychotic. Is there a cure? Oh, sure. Put him back with people. At least about 40 people. That seems to be the critical number. See, I have 48 in this ship's complement. I could run her with about 18. But if I tried to, I'd have psychos on my hands six months after blast-off. But then every one of these men on the beam stations, they're all alone, aren't they? That's right. Well, then they must get it. They do. It wouldn't pay to leave more than 40 men on a space station. And less than 40 is too dangerous. Solitosis can be homicidal. So they leave one man. Now, he gets it all right. But you can snap him out of it just by taking him back to Earth. That's why I like to have as few people as possible around when the pickup ship comes back. It can be pretty unpleasant. And what are they like? How does it affect them? Well, so far, I have picked up about 28 space station officers. I've seen 28 different sets of symptoms. I wouldn't want the job of getting those guys out of their stations and into that pickup rocket. Captain here. Pickup rocket. Signaling, sir. All right, Mr. Chalker. Prepare to receive the pickup. Alert the psychiatric staff, and I'll be right there. Uh, would you care to see them bring them in, Mr. Danbury? You're welcome, if you have a strong stomach. I don't think so, thank you. All right. Mr. Chaka, as soon as the rocket is secured, make a trajectory for the next station. Yes, sir. That's Pluto Station 3. Carry on. Oh. Pluto Station 3. That will be a honey of a job. He has been on that lump of rock all by himself for close to six and a half years. <laughs> Pluto Station 3, Daily Report, Colin Ord, Space Officer. Everything is in fine shape. Through my port, I can see Mars, Earth, Saturn, Mercury. <laughs> ah, that little devil, he's hiding behind the sun. He's been quite furtive lately. Why I'm required to record this report every day escapes me, because it's quite obvious to any empty-headed brass hat at the central office that not a word of this has been worth the tape it's been recorded on for the last five and a half years. But if it amuses you gentlemen to hear me wander, after all, you are paying for the tape. Ah, oh, which gives me a fine thought. I'm going to set the pickups through the whole station and leave the tape running. That'll give you a daily report all day, so keep on listening. Right now, I have the distinct impression that Earth is winking at me. A rather suggestive, lewd wink. It helps to see the planets, doesn't it? Hmm? Oh, I, I thought you were reading. I was. You know, if you hadn't been able to see the planets, you would have been a straitjacket case long ago. Well, who knows I'm not one now. You don't, anyway. Well, I think that so long as you talk sanely about madness, you can't be so far gone. It's out there somewhere, isn't it? The rescue ship. Somewhere. How long now, Colin? Where could they be now if they started whenever the beam failed? I haven't worked it out since the last time you asked, but they could be very close. If the beam hadn't failed, they would have been here long ago, wouldn't they? Oh, sure. Eleven months with the beam, over six years without it. Well, anyway, that triple time six years' pay adds up to quite a pile. <laughs> You'll be set up for life when you get back to Earth, won't you? And at 29... I'll be rotten with money. Oh, well. It's been nice knowing you. That's because of the others before you. I've learned a lot. I'll never talk of the others. And above all, never talk of any others to come. I'm sorry. Would you like to play chess? It's 
a long time since we did. I don't think so. Not anymore. I'm a little tired of chess. Oh, I know. I know. I understand. I won't bother you. I'll go to my room, Colin. Well, don't get upset. I'm not. I understand. You're just tired of chess. You still listening, gentlemen? That last few minutes might have been a little confusing. You'd like to know who I was talking to, wouldn't you? I'm afraid you can't hear her on the tape. That's Una. And I'll tell you what she looks like. You might find it interesting. She's beautiful, but rather cool. She always wears a white shirt and sharp, creased green slack. She's got a good figure, but in a calm sort of way. She plays a good game of chess, although I beat her two out of three times. Of course, you know why you can't hear her on the tape. But I still know, too. That's a point in my favor, isn't it? That brings up an interesting question, gentlemen, because I'm tired of Una. I'm beginning to find her a long, cool, slightly unappealing bore. My problem is how to get rid of her. I can't just tell her to vanish. She's a little too real for that. I dreamed up a ship to bring her. I'll have to find another to take her away. Well, I might as well get to it. Oh, no. No, I'm not going to bother about the ship. It's too much mental effort. I'd have to think up everything I saw. And frankly, gentlemen, I'm... I'm too tired. Maybe she'll take the hint. A lot of them did. Susie did. And Alice. Oh. I remember Margie. There was a girl. A load of... Bricks had to fall on her head. Took me four weeks to get rid of her. No. Let Una figure her own way to get off the station. She's gone. I thought she might. The ship's gone, too. Well, all in all, I don't think Una was really very satisfactory. One of these days, I'll start believing in them, and I'll be really gone. Well, if I activate the main screens now, I'll see a ship coming in to land pretty soon. Every once in a while, I have a thought that when the ship really comes, I'll think it's make-believe. Yes, there it is. A small ship curving in for landing. I suppose I could check on the detectors. I know they register anybody within 100,000 miles, but I don't bother checking them anymore because someday the moment will come when I check the detectors. And I'll see just what I want to see. Well, the ship's coming in for a landing now. I'll go out to meet it. I'm rather interested to find out what the explanation will be for the girl. Naturally, it will be a girl. It's all right. You can take your helmet off. The air's all right in here. You must be Baker. Oh, good heavens, no. Baker was before me here. You can't be one of his dreams seven years late. I'm Ord, Colin Ord. Before we go any further, just how does solitosis affect you? Well, that's new. None of them ever asked that before. It makes me see things that aren't there. And you know there's nothing there? Mm, sometimes. Do you know I'm here? I'm making a point of not wondering about it. Well, one thing you can be sure of. This. Do you see this? This is a gun. I just want you to know I'm not heaven's little gift to lonely space station officers. Is that clear? Oh, yes. Yes. What's your name? Elsa Cotterline. You want to know why I'm here, of course. Not particularly. What? Well, that's always the weakest part of the story. I don't like to press it. Why don't you, uh, take off your space suit? 
I'll tell you why, just the same. I killed a man. Why and how doesn't matter. I had access to an experimental ship. I thought if I disappeared for about two years... Oh, every... please, don't labor over it. I'm not asking questions. Why not? Well, when we get around to it, I would be interested in the story you can concoct for being dressed like the cover of a magazine story in rather minimal clothing. It's been years since I thought up anything like that. You must be a throwback. What are you talking about? You know, you're going to have a tough time with that gun when you get tired of holding it. It's a heavy gun. How long do you think it'll be before I take it from you? After all, you have to sleep. There's no door in the station you can lock that I can't get in. I know. I just wanted to make sure you weren't violent. I think I can get on with you, Ort. Mm, yes, yes, I see. The question is, my dear, whether you're real or not. Well, don't I look real? Oh, yes, but that doesn't prove anything. As a matter of fact, the realer you look, the worse off I might be. But then there still is the remote possibility that you might actually have killed someone and decided to hide out on a space station. Shall I tell you something else, Elsa? What? I'm suddenly tired of the whole business. Breathe there a man with soul so dead, I'm sure you know the rest of it. I would suddenly like to have enough people around me so that I could be sane. I would like to find women as part of life instead of having them pop up here from the depths of my rather pornographic subconscious. Ah, but you've shaken me, Elsa. Twenty-four hours ago, I was congratulating myself that solitosis hadn't really gotten me. But now I don't know. Just don't try anything funny, or you'll find out whether I'm real. The hard way. Any way is the hard way. First, I'll go out and have a look at your ship. Fourteen pounds per square inch air. Heat. Now, I take a gasoline lighter. There, the flame lights. But on the other hand, if there was no lighter and I see it, I could also see it burn when there isn't any air. As a matter of fact, how do I know that I can read a meter for air pressure? And now that I look again quickly, I find I haven't got a lighter in my hand, and as a matter of fact, the pressure meter reads zero. There's no air on this ship. As a matter of fact, there isn't any ship. Elsa is no more real than Una. All right, Colin, old boy, sit here and concentrate for about 15 minutes, and you'll be able to walk through the walls of the ship. Well, what did you find out there? You'd better leave. It was a mistake you're coming here. I'm sorry. No, don't come any closer to me. Put down the gun. Keep back. I'm warning you. Keep back. You see, it's no use. Oh, you're a good shot. You got me right between the eyes, but I couldn't feel a thing. I can't let myself be shot now, can I? Give that to me. Yeah. Now remember, if you shoot me, nothing happens. But if I shoot you, you die. Do you know that? Yes, I know that. I'll give you about 20 minutes to get that overstuffed figure back into that spacesuit and get off my planet. Frankly, I'm getting tired of hallucinations. Tired. Give me back my gun. No, no, no. I'll keep that. After a while, I'll put it in a drawer. It'll stay there until I forget it. And there won't be any gun anymore. From now on, my overblown figment, there will be no more Elsas or Susies or Margies. I am not going to give in to solitosis. Maybe. Maybe I'll bring Una back. At least she could play chess. Pluto Station 3, Daily Report, Colin Ord, Space Officer. Gentlemen, I have successfully fought off solitosis for two days and I have been alone. However, I'm afraid I'll lose as I watch my main scope now. I see a ship coming in again. I wonder what this one will be like. 
It's a launch from a larger spaceship. Maybe a lifeboat. Dorothy came in a lifeboat. I wonder what this one will be like. I've got to find out when she comes whether she's real. That's the key, as long as I know if she's real. When I don't care anymore, that's when it's really got me. The ship's down now. There she comes out of the airlock. I've got to find out whether she's real. Colin Ord. That's right. I'm Dr. Lynn of Four Star Line. Marilyn Lynn. Oh, very pretty. Are you going to tell me your story now, or do I have to wait? I'm not going to tell you anything till I've found out a little more about you. Well, you're an improvement on the last one. At least you're young and beautiful, and you're not fantastic, and you look... intelligent. What do you mean? Don't worry about me. I see things that aren't there. Particularly people. Oh, so you don't believe I'm here. Would you? If you were me. Do you know I'm not here? No, that comes with time. At least it always has so far. You mean you've always proved to yourself that your visitors were mere fantasy? With a struggle. Interesting. Controlled solitosis. I never heard of it before. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Ord. No, no, that doesn't make you real. They all say that. Why should I want to make you accept me as real? I don't know. But they all do. When will you know? Oh, I can't say. Maybe in five minutes. Maybe not for hours. How do you do it? You don't shoot me to see if I die or anything like that, do you? No, nothing like that. If I shoot you, you do die like the witches in history. They'd die if they were, and they'd die if they weren't. Your mind has remained agile enough. Naturally. I never heard of solitosis inhibiting intelligence. Would you like some coffee? Is that part of the test? Whether more coffee is actually drunk than you drink yourself? No, no, that doesn't help. It would be very easy for me to make half what I thought I made, to fill a cup with nothing and pass it back. <laughs> you look afraid. Why should I be? What am I doing? Am I doing something I don't know I'm doing? No. Would you like me to wash the cups for you when we're done? That won't prove anything. Next time they were used, I could just imagine they were washed, couldn't I? Where are you going? To find out if you're real. My ship. Go ahead. Good luck. What's she afraid about? Something I said. None of the others were really afraid of me. I can't tell yet. Nothing's happened. The meters all read 15 pounds to the square inch air pressure, but that's no good. I can't tell if I'm reading them at all. Oh. Well, the wall's solid enough. My hand hurts. That doesn't prove anything. Supposing I open my faceplate. If there's no ship and no air... All right, my faceplate's open. I'm breathing air. But then again, on the other hand, my faceplate may still be closed. Maybe I only think it's open. I can't tell. I can't tell that she isn't real. That means it's finally gotten me. It gets everyone. I don't really know if anything's real, if I'm real, if this space station is real, the planet, the universe, the galaxy. Maybe all life is in my mind. I think. Therefore, I am. Yes, I remember that from school. Oh, I'm tired. I've got to get back to the station. Very tired. Close my faceplate. If I ever opened it. I get back to the station. Got a headache. Terrible headache. I'm very tired. Are you all right now? Here, drink this. Mm. What happened? You came in the station lock and passed out. How? 
How long have I been out? About 24 hours. You're a very sick man, Mr. Rowett. <laughs> Reality. Very important thing, isn't it? It's the most important thing there is to learn. Merely to you. Solitosis naturally affects what matters most to the individual, but we needn't talk about that. But I know now. You're not real. You can't be, even though I feel you are. How did you decide that? I couldn't prove you weren't, not on your ship. I'm too far gone to figure out any test that'll work. But if you are real, then how did you avoid solitosis? The only way there is. There are 48 men and women in the relief ship that's in orbit around your planet right now. I came down in the pickup rocket. We have well above the critical number of people. I keep rational by knowing they're up there in the orbit, and as soon as I'm ready, I'll take you back up there. Well, I suppose I can wait. I don't really care if you're real or not anymore. I know. It'll take a long while before you care. You sound sad. What's the matter? It's the way you look at me. What do you mean? What do you see when you look at me? Well, you're strong. Sort of quietly beautiful. About my age. You're wearing a tunic and slacks. And you don't have a wedding ring. I noticed that. That's what I thought you saw. I'm real, but not your picture of me. I'm a doctor, Mr. Ord. All first contacts with station officers are made by trained psychiatrists. I'm a doctor. And I was a girl once. But that was 40 years ago. I'm 66. You can't be. Oh, yes. It was very nice to be a girl again. I could see myself in your eyes and I almost felt young again. As I grow old in the next few weeks, Mr. Ord, you will be recovering. That will show you how your case is progressing. When you see me as I really am, you will be all right. Assuming you're real, Marilyn, it really must take something to come down alone to see one of us. I think I see you now as you really are. Captain? Yes, Mr. Chaka. Pick up rocket all secured from Pluto number three. Hmm? How is the poor fellow? Good as can be expected. He came on board with Dr. Lin. Uh -huh. I'm telling you, these guys throw me. There he was holding her hand, looking in her eyes like he was in love with her. And you know what a dried up old bat she is? Yes, I know. All right, Mr. Chaka. Prepare to blast off. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features the Willie Lay column, Mutant of the Iron Horse, describing monorail railroads of the past and future. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Hallucination Orbit. A story from the pages of Galaxy written by J.T. McIntosh and adapted for radio by Ernest Kinoy. Featured in the cast were William Redfield, John Larkin, Vera Allen, John Moore, Terry Keene, Dick Hamilton, and Hope Risman. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. National Radio Week. Recollections at 30 salutes Radio Tonight on NBC. Countdown for blast off. X minus five. X minus one. Five.
From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, The Sea Shoot, by Isaac Asimov. We were on our way home to Earth when it happened. Six of us coming home as passengers aboard the merchant spaceship Starfire. At the start of the Second Interstellar War, the one between Earth and the planet Chloro. And then it happened. Now hear this. Condition red. Condition red. We are under attack from a chloran battle cruiser. All hands forward to battle stations. Passengers will remain confined to the after cabin. Condition red. We are being attacked. The interception by the chloran cruiser. The murderous running jewel of energy blasts and force field defenses. <laughs> We huddled in the passengers' after cabin, terrified, not knowing how the battle was going. We could hear the desperate bursts of steam through the steering tubes as the Starfire maneuvered to dodge the enemy attacks. And then... Now what? Uh, the beginning of the end, you might call it. Well, what does it mean, Stuart? You were a space pilot? It means our generators have been drained of energy. We can't fight back. But, Monsieur, All right, don't worry. They won't destroy us. They need our ship too badly. They'll simply board us and take over. But what about the crew? The crew, Colonel? If they have any sense, they'll surrender. If they choose to fight, they'll... Now, they're coming aboard. Now, be very still. Oh, Mother in heaven, help Would us. You be still? If only those fools on deck will surrender without a struggle. They are fighting. Yes, it's the end. We gotta help them. All right, don't open that door. We just can't let them die. You can't help them. I'm going. I just stop, stop him. All right. Aristide. Shut the door quickly. Aristide. My brother. That poor fool. I'll get them. My brother, I swear to you, I'll get them. Yeah, you better cover his body. The brutes. The monstrous, green-skinned brutes. They're no more brutes than we are, Colonel. This is a war. Are you defending them? I'm merely pointing out the facts. I ought to strangle you. Why not save it for the chloros? I will. I promise you I will. Well, they're probably deciding right now what to do with us. We might as well settle down and wait. We sat there, the five of us and listened while the Chloran invaders killed off the members of the Starfire's crew. Among us was Colonel Anthony Wyndham, an old Colonel Blimp type with a lame leg. Wyndham had spent his life in the militia back on Earth, but had never seen a battle. There was Demetrius Polyarchitis, who had just watched his brother being killed by a chlorocarbonizer. Polly was a huge man. He and his brother had tried truck farming in Arcturus and given it up after two seasons. Then there was LeBlanc, a sensitive, frightened young man of 22, and Randolph Mullen, who looked like somebody's caricature of a bookkeeper. A mild, balding, milk-toast little man. And there was myself, John Stewart. I was the only one who'd ever had contact with the chloro people. I had a pair of artoplasm hands to prove it. It is quiet now. Yeah, they've finished with the crew. Mr. Stewart? Yes, Mr. Mullen. What do you think will happen next? Well, they'll put a prize crew of two aboard and take us to one of their home planets as prisoners of war. Only two of the Chloros will stay aboard? Well, two is all they'll need. <laughs> Why, Colonel? You're thinking of leading a gallant raid to retake the ship? Well, simply a point of information, Dash it. Oh, then let me give you another point of information. If you want to commit suicide quick, just open that bulkhead door. Three steps inside, you'd fall on your face. But why? Don't you smell anything, LeBlanc? Get close to the door. It smells like gas. Yeah, it is gas. Chlorine gas. They breathe it like we breathe oxygen. 
They've fluorinated the whole crew's compartment. One big whiff of that and we'd all be dead. So just forget about rushing the chloros. How do you know so much about their habits, Stuart? I lived on a chloro planet for six months. You see these hands? They were mangled in the oxygenating machinery of my own quarters. They grew these artoplasm things and operated. They're weak, but at least I have hands again. Monsieur Stewart. Yeah. Will they... Will they kill us? No. Why do you say that? Because in their own way, they're gentlemen. Probably will be interned for the duration. You call them gentlemen. After they kill my brother in cold blood, you call them gentlemen. You know, Stuart, you sound more and more like a blasted greenie sympathizer. Blasted, man. Where's your patriotism and loyalty? My loyalty is where it belongs, with honesty and decency, regardless of the shape of the being it appears in. This is a ridiculous war. Why are we fighting these people? We can live only on planets with oxygen, and oxygen is poison to them. They can live only in chlorine atmosphere, which is deadly to us. Yet we're fighting them over a bunch of worthless asteroids that neither of us can live on comfortably. Well, it's, it's a matter of principle. It's a matter of stupid pride and greed. I don't like what you say, mister. Why not? Because you talk too nice about these greeny scum. They're good to you, eh? Well, they weren't good to my brother. They killed him. And I think maybe I'll kill you, you rotten oh, greeny... Holy... Mullen, Mullen, grab him. I, I can't break his hole. <laughs> They are coming in. Holy, let him go. They saved your life this time. But when I'm finished with them... What? what? I think they're opening the lock. Well, don't get between us. Holy, don't lose your head. They'll kill us all. I greet you, Earthmen. The chloro was not a pleasant sight to anyone unused to him. He was about the height of an Earthman, but the top of him was just a green stalk with eyes. He was still wearing a spacesuit to protect him from the oxygen in our compartment. In one of his tendrils, he carried a chloran gun. As he stood in the doorway, I could see Polyarchita's eyes begin to glisten with rage. Then, with a bellow like a huge bull, he threw himself at the chloro. not dead, merely temporarily paralyzed. You five will remain together as prisoners of war. We expect to reach our own planet within several weeks, your time. There you will be interned for the duration of the war. If any of you attempts to leave this compartment, we shall be forced to destroy you. That is all I have to communicate. Hadn't we better do something for Mr. Polly Arcides? Oh, he'll be all right. Just hoist him up on the cot. <laughs> That's good. Hi, right, Polly. Can you hear me, you stupid brute? His voice is coming back. Yeah. Now, I know what's going on in that thick skull of yours, Polly. You think that when the paralysis wears off, you'll ease your feelings by slamming me around some more. Well, if you do, it'll be curtains for all of us. How do you mean, sir? None of you know the chloros the way I do. Unlike us, they assume automatically that any group of Earthmen they find together comprises a biological grouping, like an ant colony. The result is that they consider the group as something, well, something holy. Now, they'd never break us up. And if one of us did any harm to another, they'd have us all executed as a bunch of chlorotype perverts, a non-functioning group. So call all the names you want. But keep your hands to yourself or we're finished. My little speech had a sobering effect on the group. For the next 24 hours, we did little besides eat our rations and think. I tried to evaluate them. The colonel I had figured for an old windbag. Polyarchitis was a hate-filled brute. LeBlanc would crack first. It was like a frightened child. Mullen? Mullen was a non-entity. A mouse instead of a man. Everything he did seemed prissyish. His voice had the quality of furtively rustling underbrush. How long?
long did you say the trip would take, Mr. Stewart? Well, the chloro said about two weeks. Gentlemen, uh, if I may interrupt. Colonel? Now, it has occurred to me that perhaps you know of some some weakness that might enable us to overcome these chloros. The only weakness they've got is that they can't stand oxygen. Oh, but there must be some way to get the best of the man. After all, there are only look, two. before I answer, Colonel, I have to know your motive. Is it to save your own skin or help Earth win the war? Oh, dash it, man, to help our side, of course. What we're looking for is the way to save the ship for Earth without losing our lives, yes? Well, all right, let's take a vote, then. The blank? I... I have a wife waiting on Earth, Mr. Stewart. I do not want to die. Uh Uh-huh. Hero number one. What about you, Mullen? I don't see how we could accomplish it without... Uh Uh-huh. Hero number two. Well, Paul Yerkitis... When I kill Chloros, it will be with my bare hands. On their planet, I will kill dozens, I promise you. Uh Uh-huh. Three down. Well, Colonel... Don't you want to march to glory, an old militia man like you? Your attitude is very cynical and unbecoming, Stuart. I see. Well, then I'll have to blow the ship up myself. Stuart! Don't worry, Colonel. I don't intend to be a dead hero. Of course, there is a way we might do it. What did you say, Mr. Mullen? There's a spacesuit and magnetic boots stored in that locker over there. We might be able to reach the control room from the outside of the ship. The outside? But... How would we get outside? Well, this compartment has a sea chute. It must. Uh, what is a, a, a sea chute? A sea chute, my boy, is a casualty chute. It doesn't get talked about much, but all the main compartments have them. They're just little airlocks down which you slide a corpse. Burial in space. Oh, blast it, Mullen. Uh, suppose you did get outside. How could you re-enter the ship? Uh, through the steam tubes, the ones they use to guide the ship. Wait a minute, Mullen. What do you know about steam tubes? I thought you were a bookkeeper. Well, on Arcturus, I got interested in spaceship models. I, I studied all about them. On my own time, of course. Yeah, yeah, naturally. At, at any rate, I learned that the steam tubes have an access vent directly to the control room for repairs and, and so forth. And the chloros, they are in the control room. Uh, what do you think, Stuart? Well, it's a video sort of idea, but it might just work. We could get permission from the chloros to open the sea chute and bury Paulie's brother. And one of us could slip into it, work forward, and climb up through the steam tube. The question being, which one? What about you? You with your loud talk and your sneers. I'm no hero, Polly. I've already said that. My object is to stay alive. The steam tube let go while you were in it, you'd be broiled like a lobster. Now, how about the colonel here? If I were younger, blasted, I'd trounce you. You know very well with my injured leg. Yeah, of course. Not to mention my artificial hands. Well, now, what unfortunate deformities do the rest of us have? Polly? You just keep talking, Mr. Big Mouth, and pretty soon we'll kick your teeth in. Of course, that's your standard reply to everything, isn't it? LeBlanc, will you do it? I... I cannot. Not even to get back to Denise? Please, I I cannot... LeBlanc needn't go. I'll do it. What? After all, it is my idea. Wait a minute. Are you serious, Mullen? Yes. Well, how... I don't understand. Why? Why you? Well, it it seems no one else will do it. But that's no reason, man. I can't think of any other. Uh, Look here. Do you really intend to go through with it, sir? Yes, I suppose I do. Well, dash it, man. Let me shake your hand. You, you're you're an earthman by heaven. You do this thing and win or die. I'll bear witness for you. It was quite a moment. Mullen the mouse had suddenly turned into a man. He just stood there awkwardly while the colonel pupped his hand. Polyarchitis seemed stunned. LeBlanc was wide-eyed. And I? Well, I was in a peculiar position, one in which I rarely found myself. I had absolutely nothing to say. That ought to bring them. I hear one. One member of our unit is dead, as you know. We request permission to jettison his body out of the casualty chute. You may do so. You'll have to open the chute lock from the control room. I will do so. Is there anything else? No. Nothing else. Thank you. You 
Oh, boy. <sighs> All right, come on now. We'll have to work fast. Mulling, get into a space suit from the emergency locker. Polly, help Mom with those magnetic boots. How do you... I'm working as fast as I can. The arm. All right, give me the helmet. The helmet. Okay. Now, Mullen, you better scratch your nose if you have to. It's your last chance for a while. What about radio contact? You can talk to us. We'll listen in on the helmet set in one of the other suits. The chloros won't have their set on the interphone frequency. Wait a moment. What for? Dash it, what's he going to use for a weapon? He isn't big enough to fight them barehanded. No, no, that's true. Well, how about one of those oxygen cylinders? Good idea. Use it to bash them over the head. Now, give him one of the cylinders equipped with a reducing valve. Now, look, Mullen, if your magnetic boots fail and you start drifting away into space, open this valve. Mm-hmm. See that? Now, you can use it like a miniature jet and try to blow yourself back to the ship. Understand? Uh, I think so. Well, I only hope it works. All right, here goes the helmet. You'd better hurry. The light is on over the sea chute. Yeah. All right. That means they've opened the lock. Here. <laughs> now, can you hear me? Oh, oh, oh. LeBlanc, give me that other space helmet. Yes. Here. Let me switch on the radio. Can you hear me, Mullen? I hear you. Fine. Plenty of air? Air's okay. Uh-huh. Polly, open the sea chute. Okay, now help him in. Are you ready? Ready. Well, good luck. Close the chute. Pull the ejector valve. Now. He's out. Oh, God help him. The light is out. Yeah. The chloros have closed the chute lock. I... I don't suppose he has much of a chance. No. Do you think... uh, Do you think he knew it? I don't know. I just don't know. Should I I, I try to contact him on the radio? Yes, I think... Wait a minute. What is it? Listen, the chloros coming. Good Lord! He's sure to miss Mullen. Yeah, Polly, get your brother's body on the cot. Put a blanket over it. Pretend it's Mullen asleep. Polly, for heaven's sake. My brother. Right, you've got to do it, man. It's our only chance. Listen, if Mullen could go out there and Very risk well. His... I will do it. Earthman. Yes. You have jettisoned the body. Yes. Good. Is there something further we can do? No, I... We are very tired. Our grief is very great at losing one of our unit. We would like to rest alone. I will respect your wishes. I see that one of your units sleeps already. Yes, yes, Mr. Mullen was overcome with grief. I leave you. Oh, brother. Holy, I thought sure you were going to rush him. With that brave little guy out there, what do you think I am anyway? And to think I laughed at him makes me ashamed. Yeah, I guess... I guess I've been saying some things that maybe weren't too funny. I owe all of you an apology. <clears throat> do you think it's safe to try the radio? Yeah, we better. Hello? Hello, Mullen. Can you hear me? Yes, I I hear you. Where are you? I'm standing on the outside of the ship. All right, now take care. One misstep and you'll be marooned in space. Now, can you find the steam tubes? I think I've found one of them already. I can feel the rim. I just hope it doesn't let go when I get inside. Be careful. I'm going into the tube now. I can feel the ladder rungs I use to repair the inside. Now, keep in contact. Good Lord. They've let go with a blast. Well, it may be the starboard tubes. Mullen, Mullen. Still here. They use the other tubes, fortunately. Now, if they don't try to correct for over-deflection... Yeah, keep moving. I seem to be... Wait. Yes, yeah, I'm at the end of the tube now, where it opens into the control room. Good, good. Now, look, there's a small metal door there. Can you feel it? Yes, I... It's locked from the other side. Oh. I can't budge it. Mullen. Mullen, listen to me. Stuart, I'm scared. I'm terribly scared. Yeah, all right, all right. Now, hang on. Don't blow up. Listen to me. Are you listening? Yes. Take the spare oxygen tank. Bang on the metal door that leads to the control room. 
The chloros are bound to hear you. When one of them comes to investigate, try to hit him with a cylinder. Now aim for the stalk on top of his body. Try to blind him. Will you do that? I... I'll try. Well, now go on. Only one can come. The other will stay at the controls. Now start banging. Any luck? No, I... Wait, I... I hear something. Something's opening the lock. The door now. I hear... Ah! Mullen! Mullen, what happened? Mullen, can you hear me? Mullen! <laughs> Mullen. Mullen. Oh, it's no use. They must have gotten him. Yeah, he was one brave little guy, that one. But suppose they have just got him in the control room. I mean, maybe he's not dead. Well? Well, then maybe one of us could rush them. We could bang on the door and jump the chloro. Well, the first guy would be a cinch to die. Well, I... I would be willing to take the chance. You? Why not? I could try. Not you. I'm the strongest. I do it. Now listen. Listen, you chaps. I'm an old man. I've got nothing to live for anyway. Suppose I throw myself at the ray gun. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Twenty minutes ago, there wasn't one of you who'd risk his little finger to get us out of here. Now you're falling all over each other. Maybe Mr. Mullen teaches us a lesson, huh? Yeah. Okay, Polly, give me the wrench. I'll start banging on the door. They say that selflessness is contagious. I guess maybe it is. I'd been a cynic all my life, a man who believed in nothing. Well, I'd come face to face with four human beings who proved that I'd been living a lie. I knew what I was going to do now. When the chloro came to investigate our compartment, I had it all planned. If only my poor, weak hands would hold out long enough. Ready? Ready. Ready. Here goes. That should bring him. Try again. Wait, wait, listen. Wait. Shh. It's at the door. Get ready. It's opening the lock. For poor old Mullen now. Uh, steady. No! Let him out! Wait! Let Stop it! Uh, it's not the floor! Wait! Uh, Good Lord! It's Mullen! Mullen? Get, get, get the helmet off! That's it! All right, now lift! Mullen! Mullen, are you all right? I, I seem to be quite all right. Well, the chloros. Both dead. At least I hope so. Well, what happened? Well, I banged on the steam tube hatch and a chloro opened it. Yeah? I hit him with a cylinder. It blinded him, I, I guess, but didn't kill him. He grabbed me and pulled me into the cabin. In the struggle, he broke my transmitter. That, that's why I couldn't talk to you. Finally, I managed to, to club him down. Well, what about the other one? The other one almost got me. It must have heard the scuffle and came into the cabin with a ray gun. What I did, I, I guess, was pure reflex. The cabin atmosphere was chlorine, of course, and the greenie didn't have a spacesuit on. Uh -huh. So I just turned on the oxygen valve in that spare tube. It was like spraying an insect with poison. Well, you're a brave man, Mullen. I'd have been scared to death. I, I... Mullen, what is it? An hour later, false hands and all, I was at the controls of the ship, headed for Earth. We'd gotten rid of the chlorinating equipment and restored the oxygen naturally. Mullen was asleep in the cabin under a sedative, or so I thought until the cabin door opened. Mullen, for Pete's sake, get back to bed. No, I'm quite all right now, really. Do you mind if I watch how you operate the ship? Oh, no, no, not at all. Sit down. You know, I guess, uh, I owe you an apology. I didn't think too much of you. That's your privilege. <laughs> no, it isn't anybody's privilege, Mullen, to despise another. For years now, I've abandoned hope for finding any decency in human beings. I owe you a vote of thanks. 
You embarrass me, Mr. Stewart. I, I didn't do it for any heroic reasons, I assure you. Far from it. But why did you do it, Molly? That puzzles me very much. Well, Mr. Stewart, I'm a bookkeeper. Seventeen years ago, I left Earth to work on Arcturus. I never made much impression on anybody on Earth, although I wanted very much to have people like me. Well, about a year ago, I started to write to my family again. Don't ask me why. And then I asked for a leave of absence to go home after 17 years. Well, I still don't understand. It wasn't patriotism or love of a woman or money or any of those things. What was it? Mr. Stewart, haven't you ever been homesick? You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine which this month features A Gun for Dinosaur by L. Sprague de Camp, a story of hunters in the bloodiest and most ferocious arena of all prehistoric Earth, where hunting reptile heavyweights is no job for human lightweights. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Sea Shoot, a story from the pages of Galaxy, written by Isaac Asimov, and adapted for radio by George Leppard. Featured in the cast were Lyle Sudrow, Stan Early, Bob Hastings, Mercer McLeod, Danny Ocko, and John Gibson. Your announcer, Bill McCord. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Enjoyable. See, I told you, and you were worried. Well, we did have several direct hits, sir, including one that peeled off the dorsal rocket. In fact, we're pretty much dead in space with no way to return. Always the spoil sport. You'll see. Next week will come, and everything will be just fine. Next week? That's right. The end of Science Fiction Month on Sonic Echo concludes with the awesome Dimension X. See you next Friday, and as always, listen to more of these shows all free from archive.org. Sometimes I wish I were deactivated. This has been an Electric Vicuna production.